Alan, also for your thoughts and uh, for this perspective. I would now like to invite the participants to join us on stage for the next block, which is a panel discussion moderated by Alim called How Have Organizations Refocused on Providing Their Services Through the Pandemic? I can see our panelists joining to us already and uh, just a brief uh, teaser that uh, some of the questions that will be answered during this panel is what challenges has the civic sector faced last year and uh, how have the main activities of NGOs transformed and how has the transition to uh, online uh, impacted the civic center? So uh, these are just a couple of questions and I therefore pass the word to Alim. Have a nice discussion. Yeah, thank you, Nata, and we are moving on. And uh, I want to welcome our next speakers. Uh, uh, our topic is uh, how have organizations focused on providing their services through the pandemic? And uh, I want to welcome uh, Alexandrina Najmovic, Secretary General of European Civic Forum from Paris, and the European Civic Network are 110 associates and NGOs across 29 European countries. And it has been working to promote an enabling environment for civic actors to engage in public sphere and community life around the values of, of equality, solidarity, and inclusiveness, and, about, and also democrat, uh, democracy, of course. Uh, the structuring of European society through Alliance building, sharing of experience and joint campaign for effective access to rights for all. Foster institutional recognition of civil relations via the settings up of European civil dialogue. Uh, our most speakers is a Volodymyr Molenka, and also director of your at the interviews uh in India, editor chief of the ukraine world initiative and internews ukraine is an organization that uh, has experience in media communications education and consulting innovation professionalism and uh, efficiency are the pillars of uh, the and interviews work in five areas of activity. Uh, first area, communication projects, as a development communication strategies, uh, communicating about reforms, etc. Uh, second uh, area, projects, supporting media, uh, working on European topics, and increasing awareness of Ukrainian citizens about the EU. Third area, is development of independent media, uh, including imp uh, improving uh, legislative uh, framework uh, for the media and development new. Uh, fourth area is enhancing journalistic standards, uh, including study visits, supporting journalists' investigations. And one more area is information security it's about fighting propaganda and disinformation and one more uh, speaker simon papashvili director of international partnership for human rights from brussels uh, international partnership for human rights is committed to promoting human rights worldwide it acts to empower local civil society groups who are working to advance the protection of human countries and assist them with raising human rights concerns at the international level. In cooperation with the partner organizations, International Partnership of Human Rights Advocate on behalf of individuals and communities who are among those uh, most vulnerable to discrimination, injustice, and human rights violations. Welcome. And uh, my first short question, 
how have you personally changed our the past uh, pandemic year? Who want to be? Who want to start, please? Simon? Yeah, I would be happy to start, Alim. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me uh, to be uh, in the first pa panel of the event, um, which seems to be a very exciting one, and I'm looking forward to uh, participating throughout. Uh, I'll take this question and maybe speak briefly about uh, some of the challenges that we uh, have seen. And as you have uh, described, our organization uh, supports local civil society groups uh, in carrying out their uh, mandates, their daily work. Um, and one of the first things that we did when the crisis unfolded was to pull together kind of a tool, an instrument that helps and helped uh, many of our partners to gather information, and gather data about ongoing human rights violations, which started to occur in the context of the crisis. Um, and you know as we all know now many if not all of the governments not only in the region that we're discussing but globally have introduced uh, restrictions uh, to with a legitimate aim to protect public health but also as we have learned uh, ma many of these restrictions were done in a in a way that arguably cannot be qualified as uh, proportionate uh, to the objective uh, for which they were imposed. So our partners have gathered uh, data about this uh, and we have compiled this information into country reports. There is one on Ukraine um, where we analyze the problems that you know, we have seen and, and pull together a set of recommendations on how uh, this can be addressed. But uh, to go back to the challenges, uh, I mean, there have been numerous challenges. And one of those challenges uh, that we have seen is a set of legislative restrictions, either uh, with a limited time scope uh, concerning only the period of active lockdowns or some of the legislative restrictions actually go beyond uh, the lockdown periods or beyond the pandemic. And uh, these uh, legislative restrictions have in many uh, ways made the life and work of civil society organizations harder than it was before. Uh, some of them had really chilling effects on uh, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, but freedom of expression is particularly concerning. And again, some of these restrictions had some legitimate objectives uh, like countering uh, misinformation and disinformation in the context of pandemic, which we, we can all agree is a very legitimate uh, issue, but at the same time, we have seen very vague definitions uh, that kind of enable uh, criminal punishments of sharing uh, sometimes legitimate information about uh, about the pandemic, but also about the uh, response responses provided by the government to these pandemics. In in some countries, like for example Azerbaijan, and I'm talking again like broadly beyond the kind of regional perspective. We have seen uh, governments going beyond uh, simply legislative restrictions and, uh, uh, well, using this uh, pandemic uh, as a pretext to go after the government critics. Uh, dozens of people have been arrested, most of them on administrative charges and have spent uh, uh, 10, 15 days in detention, but uh, some have faced criminal charges are and are still in jail. So broadly speaking, these implications uh, are serious and depending on the country context, uh, they most likely will, will persist uh, beyond uh, the situation um, that we have been uh, witnessing and observing in the, in the past year. Uh, but at the same time, we, we, we saw that the, the pandemic uh, has uh, created uh, new opportunities for the civil society actors. And, you know, despite these challenges, the civil society actors have actually shown amazing resilience in the way they face the crisis. They took uh, quick, uh, they, they were quick uh, to adapt uh, their activities in order to be able to continue providing their support and assistance to the affected communities. And there were many communities that were affected. 
Um, and maybe I will give you like three examples on this adaptation uh, strategies that you know might be important and they are by no means uh, exhaustive. One example concerns uh, provision of free legal consultations and legal aid, which many many civil society organizations, including in Ukraine, do. And prior to pandemic, most of this activity was carried out in legal aid centers, which are physical places where, where citizens can go and seek information. Since the pandemic and since the first wave of lockdown, uh, these activities have been moved in uh, online space and many organizations have created so-called uh, uh, virtual uh, legal aid centers through which citizens can seek information and even receive full legal, legal representation when this is needed. Uh, second example concerns monitoring of human rights violations remotely, which for example is very important for Crimea. Um, well, many organizations that are working on monitoring and documenting human rights violations have mastered open source investigation skills in a very short span of time. And that enabled them to gather evidence on gross human rights violations and then use this evidence for advocacy or uh, legal or strategic litigation purposes. And again, this happened in a very, very short time. Um, last example that I want to give, and I, again, I want to be brief, concerns uh, capacity building and networking uh, opportunities. Well, in the past year, we have witnessed mushrooming of capacity building and networking activity across, across the internet, which was really unprecedented in many ways. And countless number of online trainings, workshops, and networking events, such as the one we are participating in today, have taken place in the past, well, maybe 15 months. And paradoxi paradoxically, we appear to be much more well-connected today than we were before a uh, COVID-19 crisis. And even if this virtual connection is not going to replace the physical connection, it is still a connection. And it's, it's helped us create a lot of links, which are really important. So this shift in uh, mindset will inevitably continue to create opportunities for both learning and mobilization. And I hope that inevitably, again, uh, this is going to make the world a better place for all of us. Thanks, and I, I'll stop here, and I'll, happy, I'll be happy to take questions later on. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, Alexandra Volodymyr, please. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> So as you as you rightfully uh, introduced in the beginning, um, I am uh, I am part of a European network, a pan-European network. So uh, naturally, at the first phase of the pandemic, we we got together as as a network. Well, first of all, simply to to be able to cope, you know, with isolation measures and to try to keep some sanity, you know, in a context where we lost all uh, all benchmarks and we were not really understanding what is going on. Uh, and then slowly, of course, we we try to understand what is the first uh, impact on associations, which uh, for a lot of them, uh, our national and local members, they they work, you know, with they provide services or um, uh, work with volunteers to to intervene to you know, give services to vul vulnerable people, uh, elderly, uh, all sorts of activities that really need uh, physical presence. So, of course, these were the first to be affected. And um, in the same time, uh, there was huge need to, to intervene, especially to vulnerable, uh, to help vulnerable populations. So, um, we, we kind of monitored this situation. And in the first place, we we pulled up together a map of solidarity in order to give also organizations, you know, hope that uh, and uh, inspiration from one country to another that uh, even if our space is locked, we can still find ways to mobilize and to, to do our activities. Of course, there was a shift in activities because most of um, of uh, you know uh, conferences and physical activities were stopped and a lot of organizations reorganized and shifted towards advocacy needs uh because also we were facing the situation in which um 
countries were preparing, you know, their exceptional measures to help uh, economic sectors uh, cope with the crisis and sustain uh, employability and uh, and all sorts of uh, resilience measures. But we realized that in most cases, these measures were not automatically applying to a not-for-profit sector. Um, and so um, very quickly we, we we put our acts together to to join forces and advocate at the European level to uh, for the European Commission, for example, to intervene uh, before. Be, uh, behind the member states to ask them to tailor uh, specific measures to the civil society sector. And it took enormous efforts because then we realized how, how this whole not-for-profit sector is somehow um, not under the radar of the institutions uh, for a lot, of, for a great deal of, uh, of our activities. So, um, in the end, we managed to 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 have a kind of monitoring scheme uh, put in place by the European Commission towards the member states, and this led, in the end, to an obligation for the member states, for example, to consult civil society organization one while also preparing their. Um, national resilience and recovery plans but this was not an automatic and easy way to go so first of all we realized that not only our space uh, is in danger and this is the, a trend as my colleague said that we are observing not necessarily only now during the pandemic but the pandemic brought a sort of magnifying mirror on some trends that we were already noticing uh, for for quite a while uh, in Europe. Uh, trends that that um, tend to limit the space of uh, civil societies to act, to voice opinions, and of course the actors that are, whose action is deemed to be more political, uh, in the sense of advocacy, that they they are very uh, bold on advocacy, holding governments to account and uh, raising against uh, government. Um, policies or uh, simply uh, showing the loopholes in public policies while well, they are in the front line. You were mentioning environmental, uh, it was mentioning in the uh, beginning, environmental activists, uh, and it's true that we see that they are in the front line in the last years, but more generally every um, every organization or movement or, or group that is uh, doing advocacy work. Um, and these restrictions, they range from uh, restrictive legislation to the freedom of association or freedom of assembly. And it can go through simply uh, transparency legislation, which is overburdening, putting you know, uh, restrictions on, uh, on the freedom to access funding or uh, the freedom to register or to declare activities. Um, then it can go through uh, restrictions of the right to assembly and of course the pandemic uh, was was a natural um a natural situation where we had to give up some of our rights, but the problem was that in most uh, in most cases, or in a lot of European countries, in the first phase of the pandemic, we had blanket uh, uh, um, restrictions of the freedom to freedom of assembly, and these were quite disproportionate uh, compared to compared to the situation and. Even maybe the most worrying is that some of these legislations are there to stay <laughs> beyond the pandemic. And we see uh, this legislation also uh, in countries, not only like you would be used to hear about Hungary and Poland, but also in um, old democracies like France, the country I am living in. Uh, restrictions to freedom of assembly, uh, restrictions in the way that uh, we can record, for example, policemen during demonstrations and uh, heavy-handing police is, is also a raising trend that we can see all across Europe, the way that registration um, assemblies are being repressed by the police and uh, and yeah so we we continued monitoring all these trends but in parallel as my colleague said we wanted also to to bring into the spotlight the organization the self-organization of civil society and it was really really impressive to see that in most crisis situation and this was no exception uh, civil society actors are often the first ones to come, to arrive, and the last ones to leave. And we wanted to to give visibility to this also, not only in our publications, but also uh, through uh, advocacy activities that we organized with the institutions and with the media. Um, yeah, another another issue was the the. Um, 
the shrinking of spaces for dialogue with institutions. In normal times, uh, of course, depending on the country, uh, you have uh, frameworks for civil dialogue between authorities and uh, civil society actors. And again, during the pandemic, we saw that these activities were put to a halt um, and sometimes in the, to the expense of, uh, of democracy and respect for fundamental rights, because if these organizations had the possibility to participate and to have a dialogue with institutions, maybe we could have um, avoided some uh, restrictive provi provisions in legislation. But all in all, yeah, to, this is just to say that uh, indeed civil society was and still is in the front line. And I think that we, we really need to, to give visibility also and maybe to have a better coverage in the media. It is always very difficult to, to get these stories in the media, but uh, we really need to, to join forces and to make media all over more aware of, uh, of how civil society is there in the front line to, to help people in need, but also to, to play this role of watchdog to, to hold uh, the powerful to account when, particularly when they, um, they take on uh, democ democracy and fundamental rights and freedoms. So I don't know, I think that uh, you will have several questions, so I will stop here and uh, wait for next questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrina and Vladimir Thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be here and, uh, and uh, great difficulty to talk after so, so wonderful experts and a wonderful account. So we'll try to add something, some value added if possible. To follow uh, follow up what Alexandrina said about this issue uh, of uh, freedom and security, I think it's one of the uh, one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest questions for debate. And uh, as before the pandemic, I would say that uh, only societies that faced uh, a certain vacuum of security, of military security, or human security were asking this question what what should be the balance between freedom and security now we see that this discourse has basically uh has taken the the, the world stage so we are we're talking in every hour society uh and the, the similar question we're asking the similar question if there are a threat to security to national security or individual security what should we do what is the limit uh, to which we can uh, limit basically freedoms, for example, freedom of assembly, freedom of gathering, etc. And I think this is a, a very interesting question. Uh, again, uh, in Ukraine, I would say that this is a debate uh, which was quite obvious for us and quite um, quite typical for us uh, since 2013, 14 already, maybe even earlier. But now we, we see this debate going all over the world. And I think it's it's a very, very interesting and very important debate. Now, how the pandemic influenced all arts and civil society? I would try to focus both both on positive sides and on negative sides. So on the on the positive side of the of the spectrum, of course, it, it is making us much more flexible than before, uh, especially in the service sector, which is not really dealing with some material production and which does not require physical presence of people. It makes makes things a lot of easier. So if you take civil society, we are doing really lots of things, um, especially in my field, in the media and communication field, we are doing lots of things on distance. Um, and that basically uh, also leads to a question whether uh, the structures of our societies will, will dramatically change even after the pandemics, because uh, if you don't need physical presence of, of a mass, massive amount of people who are dealing with the, in the service sector, for example, or in the information sector, what will happen? What will happen with our cities? What will happen with our uh, education? What will happen, for example, with uh, with uh, with several with many many professions that are connected to the issue of uh, physical presence for example babysitters what will happen to babysitters uh, when they need to replace a, a parent who is going to work somewhere in another place right so and and this is just one of the examples what will happen with, with restaurants what will happen with uh, with the supermarkets etc 
I think this is a very, very interesting question. Uh, another positive thing uh, is uh, basically maybe better, better balance between leisure and work, although it is kind of um, ambivalent because many people are saying that this, uh, this, uh, this distance between leisure and work start uh, becoming even more fluid. But generally, uh, many, many people agree that, you know, you, you have more time for yourself. You're not, you're not spending too much time on traveling, for example, and you, you can you can work in Kiev but live in, in any other place. Another issue which which is positive, I think, is a kind of a rethinking of the internet. So we are more and more rethinking uh, the internet. And uh, while, let's say, um, in 2014, in, if you take Ukrainian example, 2014, we we're talking about the internet as a kind of a, you know, a, a space which which is able to mobilize people to give them solidarity for protesting, etc. Uh, then after 2014 and next, we, we have seen lots of negative trends, like internet is polarizing, etc. And we have we are seeing, of course, the continuation of this trend uh, right now in, in these days. But now we have also seen, I think, a very interesting uh, trend is is um, uh, the way how internet is is uh, is giving this opportunity of uh, of a solidarity of a group of a group cooperation etc and how it also in my sector in media sector you know, basically facilitates creating of some niche products a very uh, tiny uh, tiny you know media who who are going on crowdfunding so people are increasingly using internet because they lack physical communication they increasingly use internet for creating commonly creating some some good things some good media some communication platforms etc and, and i think this is this is very interesting very important and of course information better exchange of information more access to information look at how podcasting is developing it's just over the past year we have just a boom of podcasting. It was very interesting because experts on podcasting were telling us that, look, podcasting will, will have problems during the pandemics because people mostly listen to podcasts when they drive a car. Well, uh, we see that the, the, the opposite is true, is that during the pandemic, we have kind of a boost of podcasting. And podcasting is also a very interesting thing because it is very cheap in entering the market, but then, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of th so it makes it makes your information space much more uh, much more flexible and much more rich and it is very interesting interesting genre uh problems there are not only positive things but problems the first problem as i see it is that online world virtual world is basically decreasing our empathy so de decreasing our real communication we are good at exchanging information. We are worse and worse at real communication. Real communication is is always presence. Is always a question of presence. Uh, and uh, in today's like democracy theories all over the, all over the world, one of the key words of recent years before the pandemics was the the word presence because in the increasingly online world where everything is you know online and virtual what is really important is 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 is, is the sense of presence uh, voters feeling the sense of presence of politicians or uh, decision makers and the sense of presence of your community etc and i think this issue of presence is is decreasing and, and disappearing even more and the, this is a great great question for everybody and of course it creates also difficulties for civil society which was if civil society certain civil organizations are working with certain target groups and they used to be you know working in certain presence for example we are working with journalists now we moved this um of this working online and for example if we make a training we organize it not for 15 or 20 people who, who we bring physically but we can organize this for 100 people but the question is what is the um due to this elasticity of products what is the real like penetration rate what are, are we really deep uh, in communicating with these people and I think these issues of uh, empathy, present, and communication are, are really something which should be 
addressed in the post-pandemic world. The next question is education. Uh, in Ukraine, for example, and I think also all over the world, we have kind of, we, we have seen devaluation of the concept of education. Education as providing uh, learning services, providing knowledge, etc. But education is far more for than universities. Is not only universities who are giving you knowledge, but universities who are giving you communities. Uh, you you feel kind of also a part of right. And um, Ukraine was quite bad at creating universities as communities co compared to many other countries. And I I I I see a big problem that it will if it will devaluate and it will decrease even more. Uh, so again, it's it's related to the question of 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 communities. So there is lots of supply of knowledge. And uh, we can really knowledge, advice, consultancy, and it is it, it, it has become great, and we really have much more access to knowledge uh, and consultancy and everything else. But uh, uh, education is also kind of a, 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 a university or any education thing, school, uh, right? University is also about communication, empathy. Uh, dealing with emotions, dealing with everything else. And, of course, we are losing on this. Uh, another media issue is, of course, information bubbles. So everybody knows this term. And I think the pandemics creates even more information bubbles. Mm, and how to how to overcome the boundaries of these information bubbles, it, it, it became even more and more difficult. Because you, you, you can go beyond your information bubble when your information bubble is challenged by somebody. And you, usually this challenge is basically also deals with certain presence. And of course, when we're communicating all the time through Zoom or through other online platforms, uh, we are not challenged because, well, if we see another point of view, we just close the <laughs> close the application and that's it. And that's a, a real, real problem. And the last thing is let's travel. So if, of course, we can save a lot of money of not, on not traveling, but less we travel, less we are able to overcome our horizons. Again, coming back to Ukrainian society, one of the big problems is that many people do not go beyond their regions. And this creates tensions. If you don't see other people in other region, this creates tensions. If you don't see, be, if you don't go beyond your country, of course, this creates kind of an information bubble. And I think uh, in the post-pandemic world, we should not be that you know naive of thinking that we can uh, supplement one uh, field trip or one travel with ten zooms. I think we should. We should come back to a physical reality and uh, understand how it is important to, to see people in person, to travel in person, um, etc. These are my points. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and thank you that you uh, can turn even some negative uh, tendencies uh, from the current coronavirus pandemic to positive. And I ask my next question. I want to make some remind uh, that uh, our participants chat uh, questions in um, our uh, event chat. And uh, now I want to focus uh, into your your organizations and uh, what functions did uh, the organization have to give up and how uh, were the main activities of your NGOs transformed during the pandemic? Simon? Thanks, Salim. Um, I, I don't think there is one single activity that we really had to give up. You know, it was more about uh, doing things uh, in a different way compared to pre-COVID situation. You know, for example, my organization does a lot of capacity building work um, and that's, you know, training and coaching stuff. And uh, yeah, once we have this situation, we simply started doing uh, more online trainings, which actually we were doing even before. We started doing it in 2017. Um, 
and we already had a uh, well working model in place uh, that has been tested and has been approved. Um, so we simply did more of it. And yeah, actually, as I said, uh, this uh, you know mindset shift uh, enabled us to do to involve more people in our capacity building work, uh, to do more networking events, uh, to connect more like-minded people, uh, to generate ideas, to find solutions uh, together. So, yeah, I think uh, there is nothing that we really had to give up. Thank you. Yeah, Shall I? Yeah, uh, I would very much join um, Simon also uh, to say that we didn't. I mean, it's easy uh, to to think that uh, the functioning of a network can be easily or more or less easily uh, transposed also online, uh, particularly the life of a transnational network. Even though, um, of course, uh, we we all do like physical contacts and we we can't wait to to see each other. But in the same time, I think we we were able to take and to make the network meet much more often than we did in the past. Also because of uh, budgetary constraints. I mean, just to give you an idea, uh, as you said, we have more than 100 organizations member. And so to organize a general assembly, it's a considerable budget to organize. We generally meet uh, once a year with the network in general assemblies and uh, three times a year in smaller formats, you know, on conferences. But um, but now during the pandemic, practically we met every month. Uh, with the whole network and with the steering committee and the board of directors, we met even, I think, every week, you know, to to assess the situation every time we had, you know, the changing landscape, new legislation underway, the monitoring. And it, it, this also helped, helped, helped us, you know, uh, keep a certain mental health. <laughs> Uh, while being isolated. Um, but another aspect, so maybe I would say that uh, definitely we um, we increased our advocacy efforts, uh, monitoring and advocacy efforts. But uh, maybe most importantly, I think we, we were able to take a step back and to look at the lessons that we learned from the crisis and how through our work in the coming years we can um, maybe not change the world, but uh, um, make the most out of these lessons. And uh, maybe, maybe the the first lesson would be that uh, we saw uh, that the pandemic brought in the in the first line um, essential workers. You know that we all deemed to be heroes uh, that our uh, survival depended on, and uh, we realized also how. Uh, how the social hierarchy was so um, so um, uneven um, developing, and how how these workers were invisible actually for for part of the society. They were invisible, and unfortunately, they are still invisible for part of the policymakers. And how difficult for them is to access uh, their their basic rights and uh, this is one of the lessons which then goes in hand in hand with another one that the pandemic brought back on stage the notion of common good and the notion of solidarity and uh, well in the first phase we 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 were a lot of people that um, were hoping that uh, with the common good also state power is back, you know, to to uh, to get on social policy and to, you know, to get what is needed to respond to the needs of a, of a population that is more and more feeling uh, left aside. Uh, socially and uh, and even democratically, because these people that are living uh, at the threshold of poverty or simply that they perceive themselves as being threatened by poverty, by uh, social exclusion, by discrimination. For a great deal of them, they also lose trust in democracy and uh, trust in democracy as a, as a way to respond to their needs and to, to uh, you know, 
to to design policies that uh, that take them into account and we saw this also before of the before the pandemic of course i don't know how much you were familiar for example and how much you were struck by to see for example the streets of france uh, being populated with people that simply needed to put on yellow vests so that they become visible you know uh, i know i don't know how it was portrayed in the media um i just know from experience i'm also romanian at origin and i know that romanian media for example only portrayed violence uh, and completely sidelined uh, the core uh, element of this mobilization, which was the fact that uh, for, for a country like France, it was so striking to see how important slots of, sort of population feel like being at the margins of the society of democracy and of the system itself. So, uh, yeah, that was a, an alarming bell um for our democracies and i think that now it is also up to us not to you know to come back to the to the usual world not so uh not with business as usual and to trying to to learn from these lessons and to um to do what we can uh to call on the politicians and the policy makers to to stick to this notion of common good and uh you know to balance the economy with the uh, with the social dimension and to make democracy actually uh, strike this balance because i think that uh, this is key uh right now in in terms of uh organization of uh, world relations at the global scene so this is something that we will keep in mind also in the future to to have on our radar yeah. yeah, I would like to follow up. I think what Alexandra said about the uh, gilet jaune, uh, the yellow, uh, yellow jackets, is precisely this lack uh, of presence in in our in information society. All the media will report primarily about violence. This is this is the you know the law of the media, and uh, we, for example, face the same challenge uh, in Ukraine during Maidan when uh, media was focused on uh, you know violence issues and not on solidarity issues which was Maidan all about and I think this is one of the challenges of our sector my sector media sector is that we should be working on recreating presence and recreating presence mean recreate because uh, you know we have a very fragmented uh, you know uh, perception of the reality and uh, professional media of course will well some some of the media will will take only a fragment of reality and substitute this fragment for the whole reality and uh, the big task in this post pandemics world which will even make the world even more fragmented i think the big task of the of the journalists of, of media people is to kind of a reconstruct the whole picture and reconstruct uh, uh, to create a content which will uh, at least help a person who is not there who is not present on the protest to feel the genuine essence of the protest for example or a person who is not a a jobless uh, person who lost just his or her job because of the closure of his factory to feel uh, and see the real experience of this of this uh, person this is this is i think the great challenge and um, coming back to your question Aline, what we uh, were giving up and what we're not giving up of course I, I also agree that i think every organization was thinking in terms of how to adapt to this reality and um, for example one of the key things in uh, creating recreating presence in the media sector is making press tours the more you bring journalists to to places right to to to, to some places they will never go uh without you because they like money because they like resources etc the more you bring journalists there the better but of course during the pandemics we couldn't take groups of journalists and bringing our task for example uh in 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 one of the projects in cooperation with uh, the european union in ukraine uh, to kind of a stimulate uh journalists going to different places to understand what what european integration means by their own experience uh, to go to good good businesses or good factories etc 
And uh, we invented a kind of, a, instead of collective press tours, we invented the concept of individual press tours. So we are talking with the journalists, okay, what topic are, are you interested, where you want to go? I, I want to go to this particular factory in, in another oblast and, and take a story from that. Okay, we help uh, these, uh, these journalists to go there and make his or her own report. Another thing is that we, uh, you know, were... Uh, also facing this lack of storytelling, la lack of feeling of presence, and we are not—we are not really a, a media per se. We are kind of a media NGO, but we, at a certain moment, we, we decided that there is a need to stimulate again and again this civic journalism that people tell the stories about their regions by themselves, and uh, we we, we we started teaching people how to do good video stories with your mobile phone. And we ourselves started doing that, traveling across the country, one person, not a bunch of people, with a certain security, of course, and with not with, a, you know, we, we could not travel with big teams, but we can travel when one journalist using an iPhone created fantastic stories about ordinary life of ordinary people, minority groups, etc. And we uh, sent the message uh, to the whole society, do the same. We and 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 they did the same. So we've got several dozens of interesting stories from all over Ukraine. When people, you know, in this lack of communication, lack of presence, people people just using the 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 tools available were sharing their about their regions, about their community. This is also important. So we, we always shoot things in terms of creating, well, the banality, <laughs> creating the crisis into the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Ode. And uh, <clears throat> my last question is uh, about your our target audiences. Uh, and uh, how has the pandemic affected uh, for uh, our target audiences and how uh, the audiences uh, changed uh, during this pandemic. And uh, one more question, what new approaches uh, working with the audiences will you practice uh, after the pandemic? I hope that uh, we, have, we will have this new reality that named after the pandemic. Volodya, Simon, Alexandrina. I will say very briefly, our target group is journalists. So, and uh, journalists are also, of course, very vulnerable, especially in the regions. Major uh, task right now, I think, is to share the skills more and more because pandemics was also very bad for economy right we, we all know that and uh for example a huge a huge blow to to the to the advertising market and which many journalists uh, uh, little small media are surviving and <clears throat> i think the key thing is now to how to turn internet uh, from the battleground into a solidarity tool and uh, turning internet, of course, it will always be a battleground, and people will abuse each other and and uh, and uh, and create and recreate troll armies, hate speech. Well, it is there. It's it's all in our nature, unfortunately. But I think we 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 need to mobilize the good, the the bright side of it. And the bright side of it is that people can, in this very you know flexible actually work financially flexible people can be co-founders of uh, of media and co uh, co-creators of media and this is what we are now seeing that more and more media uh, especially small media which don't actually need a lot of money uh, which are going on crowdfunding which are going on patreon which are going on other platforms and if a particular journalist or a particular blogger is able to you know collect uh, I don't know, even $500 per month support through Patreon, and this is feasible, very feasible. It's already a, a an instrument uh, securitizing his or her job, So, and it's solving a very important problem of, of uh, funds and money. I think this is, this is one of the priorities, and this is what we are trying to do. Thank you, Lloyd. 
Simon, please. Thank you, Ali. Um, well, our kind of target audience and beneficiaries are, as I said, civil society organizations, but in general, people whose rights are uh, violated uh, in, in, and we're focusing on former Soviet Union uh, space. Um, well, I would say that there, there are different groups of people who have been disproportionately affected by these pandemics and who somehow unfortunately continue to be affected and, and suffer as a consequence and uh, uh, Ellen uh, already mentioned one of those groups uh, women and we, we see that indeed this pandemic has affected women in in a much worse way than it did men uh, and one of these bad symptoms that we witnessed again across the region is uh, alarming rise in, in the rates of domestic violence um and other vulnerable groups like for example lgbt communities uh ethnic minorities religious minorities etc uh, they have all suffered disproportionately unfortunately because of this but again we, we have seen uh, a kind of new wave of grassroots uh, organizations who have been able to mobilize and to join their resources and their forces to be able to meet the needs of uh, of vulnerable groups that have been affected you know again going back to uh, domestic violence you know we have seen uh, many new organizations that appear to cope with this challenge uh, new shelters uh, have been uh, put in place and also we have seen uh, solidarity uh, and joint action between different groups of organizations, different types of organizations that were not uh, necessarily collaborating uh, uh, before. And, and you know, one most rec recent example which comes to my mind is uh, a series of protests in my home country of Georgia around the uh, uh, Namahwani Cascade uh, uh, case. It's a big uh, uh, electric dam which is being, uh, well, uh, under construction uh, by a Turkish company and they're big question marks in terms of environmental impact uh, of this uh, project and basically uh, there are different groups of organizations who are leading the protest and that includes you know people and organizations that were would never speak to each other before but now they're you know going out in the street and protesting shoulder to shoulder so again we we, we saw that uh, the pandemic has had some positive impact as well in terms of bridging uh, the gap between different types of civil society organizations. I guess it's uh, on me now. Um, yes, our, uh, our main audience is also uh, civil society, uh, both organized but also less or non-organized as we as we sometimes call them like social and civic movements. And um, well, the pandemic had a positive impact uh, on our outreach, of course, like uh, as I said, it's uh, it's much more complicated to get together 200 people from all over Europe in physical presence. Uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, our events uh, were reaching out to hundreds of people. OK, we can ask the question how meaningfully, but uh, but still we, we see a potential uh, with the digitalization of increasing outreach, um, but more than more than the click outreach or you know the the passive uh, following of conversations, I would rather say that we increase the pace of our uh, encounters and meetings. Sometimes is uh, disruptive and destructive for us because uh, out of a whole entire uh, Zoom day, uh, you know, we we. We are wondering how much our brain can function normally and how much can we give more or better to the to our uh, daily tasks but on the other hand this allows us to um, 
you know, connect some dots. And what we are trying the most as a network is to overcome fragmentation because we, we do see a lot of fragmentation, well, both in terms of the issues that uh, organizations work on and a lot of organizations focus on issues, organizations and movements. And for us, it is key to get out of this silo approach uh, and to, uh, to make people realize that uh, environment is connected to the economy, to the social issues, and ultimately to democracy and vice versa. All we are very keen on connecting these, I would say, maybe four main pillars. Um, and I think that it's very important, as I said previously, that we are aware of this so that when we get back to the world, we really do build back better. So I think that we really need to connect all our uh, civic forces across the borders, across uh, areas of work, across our constituencies, you know, to make sure that we we don't get back with a blind eye, you know, and we don't give up on uh, on certain uh, principles. Um, you know, that we are not the earth custodians, uh, we are the earth custodians and not its uh, owners or that democracy is our best antivirus. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, we will manage to, to keep that alive once we get back to the normal pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. And uh, I want to thank uh, our speakers. I want to thank you, Vladimir, uh, Simon, Alexandrina. And so, uh, you know, I want to thank you uh, for the important and great work uh, that you do in your organizations and your societies. And now I want to give the floor uh, to you, Nata. Uh, um, and now we <clears throat> will pass to our practice uh, part of conference. Thank you and see you.